Now we're going to go ahead and enter into our series of lightning talks. Each one of these is going to be uh, 15 minutes, including Q&A. Um, and so we're going to keep these pretty fast paced. Uh, first one up here is uh, David Roethlisberger. And I'm going to start a rumor that like he's related to someone on the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, so he says he can get everybody free tickets. Um, so with that, uh, he is from YouTube. And he is going to talk about automated set-top box testing, which will be fascinating. Uh, Thank you. Need that. OK. Um, <clears throat> so it's you view, not YouTube. Oh, sorry. Oh, you view. <laughs> um, if, so if we could have my um, laptop up on the, on the screens, please. OK. Um, so at UView in the UK, we make set-top boxes. And to test our set-top box, we have scripts running on a PC sending infrared signals, um, pretending to be a human user pressing buttons on a remote control. And we check the video output from the set-top box using video capture hardware and image processing to ensure that it's done the right thing. Um, of course, we have other, many other types of tests as well, but this is the most interesting one to talk at a conference like this. So today, uh, what I'm going to show you is how you might go about implementing such a system. Uh, the command line we're looking at here runs GST launch. Um, which is provided by GStreamer. GStreamer is a set of libraries and utilities um, for handling audiovisual media. If you use Linux on your desktop, um, your media player is likely to be Totem, which is built on GStreamer, just to give you one example. Uh, so let's run this. Uh, GST launch takes as its uh, command line argument a GStreamer pipeline. So these exclamation marks here are GStreamer's equivalent uh, to the shell's pipes. So this pipeline has a video test source element um, generating a video stream with this test pattern. And its output is piped to this color space converter element, which converts each frame uh, to a format understood by the next element in the pipeline, uh, which is X image sync. Uh, a sync is an element that consumes video, and this particular one renders it to an X11 display. GStreamer ships with a ton of different um, elements, such as this one. V4L stands for Video for Linux. It's an API for drivers. And uh, V4L2 source supports any device with Video for Linux drivers, such as my laptop's webcam here. Or it could also be an external video capture device. Uh, we can customize uh, the behavior of individual elements by setting their properties. So if I go back to video test source, um, I can set its pattern property here to something different. And we can see it's generating a different video pattern. Uh, now here's what gets interesting. I'm going to add this template match element. Um, template match is a thin wrapper around an open source image processing library called OpenCV. The CV stands for computer vision. Uh, OpenCV is uh, originated by Intel. And template match takes a path to an image. And I'll show you what this image looks like. It's this white circle and a black background. And when I run this, uh, we can see that template match is drawing a red border uh, wherever it finds a match in the video stream. Now, the uh, CPU overhead of the image um, processing is introducing a little bit of jitter into the, into the video stream, which causes some time stamping problems for the sync. Um, so I just tell the sync to ignore um, timing information in the stream itself and just display frames as soon as they arrive, and it's a little bit smoother. Uh, right, um, so each element can post messages to the GStreamer bus. So I'll ask GST launch to print those messages. And here we can see that template match has posted a message for every frame that it's processed, um, showing us whether or not it found a match and the x and y coordinates of that match. So I hope that you can see how all these pieces fit together and how easy it is to develop a video capture um, image matching system of this type. 
Uh, all these components are open source, so we can really take control of our test infrastructure. We're no longer beholden to proprietary systems. Now, I consult to a company in the UK called UView. Um, UView is a joint venture by the BBC and other major UK broadcasters and ISPs. And uh, UView makes a set-top box. To test the set-top box, we've developed STB Tester, and we've open sourced it. So it's built on these components that I've just demoed. Um, so it supports any video capture hardware with video for Linux drivers, or indeed any GStreamer source element. And it uses GStreamer's Python bindings. It allows you to write your test scripts in Python, and they look like this. Uh, Set.boxtester.press sends an infrared signal. Wait for match, searches for the specified image, and raises an exception if it doesn't find it. Uh, so this script um, navigates to our network and internet settings uh, menu, and we've encapsulated that into a separate Python function so it can be reused across scripts. Then we press down until we find this image. And I'll just ask my editor to display those images in line. So I'll remind you, this is just Python, and those were just string literals. It's uh, my editor that knows how to um, display the images in line. It's um, Emacs before anyone asks. So, so we press down until the submenu is selected. Uh, we press OK. Then we press right until this automatic option is selected. Uh, then we press down and we assert that the next button has been highlighted. We press OK, and within 30 seconds, we expect to find this image. Uh, so as you can see, it's very simple. It's very readable. Uh, it's entirely procedural. And it reads much like a manual test script uh, written in English. So non-programmers on the test team have no trouble understanding this um, and relating it to their own requirements, uh, test coverage matrices, and so forth. But at the same time, it is Python, so it's very powerful, and you can do anything you can imagine, really. So I'll just show you a couple of quick examples of other stuff we've done. Um, this is a video I recorded earlier of an STB tester script that knows how to navigate uh, through this double carousel of players. So I've told it to find a BBC iPlayer, and uh, now that it's found it, I've told it to find 4OD. So again, the, re the red rectangle is showing us where um, STB Tester has found a match for what it's looking for. And now that it's found 4ID, I've asked it to find demand 5. So it's looking for this um, long, thin blue rectangle to identify the current selection. It looks for an image of the unselected player to find where it needs to go. And it figures out what buttons it needs to press to accomplish that. And I'll just play that again while I show you the uh, source code implementing that logic. Uh, I won't go through it, but it's just to show you um, that it's fairly simple. It's, you know, it's barely two pages um, of code, and most of that's uh, doc strings and, and doc tests, although I have removed error handling. But if you're interested in seeing the full code, uh, I've posted it on stbtester.com as an example. So essentially, your script would just call find player, pass in an image of the unselected player to know what it needs to find, and an image of the selected player to know when it's got there. As another example, this state machine is UView's setup wizard. So each, uh, each image in this diagram, each node, represents a possible state that the UI can be in. And each edge represents an action that a user can do from, from that given state. Um, this diagram is generated entirely automatically from some Python code we've written to um, describe the setup wizard. Each image you see uh, is exactly the same image that STB Tester uses to identify that the UI is in that particular state. And each edge, each user action, is a Python function that carries out that action. And you can click on one of them, and it shows you the source code implementing that, and this is all fully hyperlinked, so you can drill down as deep as you like. It's very helpful to, um, you know, uh, non-programmers can, can, can still follow the flow of, of each of these functions here. Um, so so you'd, you'd, you could write a test script where you explicitly call each of um, these actions in the order you want them, or you could do something smarter. You know, we do, after all, have this representation of the state machine, so we can randomly generate um, random walks through it. Or you could have a test script that takes a given path and just tries 
passing the power to the set-top box at every possible stage just to see what happens. You know, all this kind of stuff that's incredibly tedious to do manually, especially for each software release. I'll show you the full state machine there. All done. So if you look at this in a certain light, it almost looks like a wireframey kind of UX design document. And really what we're aiming for is fully machine checkable specifications. And this is all generated from plain text files, so you know it's version controllable, you know, all that good stuff that we're used to for our code as developers. Uh, we can now have for our specifications as well. It's very exciting. Um, before I quickly take some questions, um, I'll just point out um, the stbtester.com has uh, loads of documentation. Um, we've got introductory material, some videos to help you get started. Um, there's a mailing list if you have any questions. And we try to do the development of it as openly as possible. So thank you for your time. Great, thank you, David. All right, um, we can go ahead and pull up the moderator. Uh, if you have questions, you go to either side here. Um, in terms of asking questions, that was very fascinating the way you, you did the uh, the sort of image matching and so forth. Um, I'll start off with a question of my own. How complicated does the image logic have to be, or is it just very pixel perfect in terms of matching and looking for elements? Um, so, uh, since we capture video directly from the set-top box, we're not going through cameras or anything like that. We have fairly high fidelity images, but um, we do have uh, video capture hardware that does H.264 encoding um, in, in the hardware, so we do get some artifacts from that. Um, so our image processing algorithm does handle that, and it's got a few knobs that you can tune either globally or for a specific image, uh, if you'd like. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, he also reinstilled my faith in Emacs as being cool, the fact that it will embed the images for me. <laughs> um, OK, I'll take a, a question right here off of the moderator. It says, um, does having images and test scripts or test scripts cause flaky tests when st styles change? Uh, so I wouldn't call it flaky tests. I'd say that the tests start failing predictably if the style changes. Um, so yes uh, is the answer to that question. Um, uh, as you hopefully gathered from some of my examples, most of the actual image matching we actually pull into um, library functions, which uh, the test scripts call themselves. So very few test scripts actually read like um, the one full of images that I showed you at the beginning. So it's just a matter of changing uh, the common functions and um, all your scripts start working. And you, you can do things like uh, match any of these images so that your tests continue to work across different software releases if you need to still be testing you know, a version that's in production that's got different uh, images than a, a development version. Nice. Um, clearly, this next question was written by somebody who has done this. Um, <laughs> it says, how do you manage the image repository without sucking the soul out of some poor test engineer? <laughs> um, well, again, every, everyone seems to be fixating on these images. Um, <laughs> To be honest, the main problem we've had is not uh, with the image repository, it's with flaky video capture hardware. Um, so, so I guess the answer to this question would be uh, much like the previous one, um, where the image repository is very, fairly small um, compared to the number of tests that use it. And we also have a lot of uh, unit tests of our tests. Um, we, we've captured a lot of screenshots and any time we want to make a change to the image processing algorithm, we run all those unit tests against our collection of previously captured images to make sure that um, everything continues running properly. Um, great. Was this, is this a live question? Yeah. Okay, sure. Go ahead. We have time for just one more. Okay. So just wondering if you used your uh, framework to measure performance, let's say, such as latency. If you click on something, how long does it take to go to the other view, such mm -hmm. things like that? Okay. So. So, um, so when, when, we're, when we're doing the image processing on a full-sized, um, you know, 720p or, or whatever full-sized video stream, um, even with a fairly um, powerful computer, uh, we can't process do the image processing in real time. So what we do generally is we just uh, drop frames if, if we can't process them. 
But for testing performance, um, we, we flick a switch in, in, in the test script um, just, just for a, a, you know, we use Python context manager to, to have this apply to just a portion of the script, um, where we queue up every single frame and, um, and then, we, then we can measure things like that, like uh, smoothness of animations or, or latencies. Latencies are a bit difficult because we've got to take into account all the various latencies in the system, the video capture device, the encoder, the infrared emitter, and so on. So it's, uh, we're working on it. We're getting there. Great. And with that, uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Tony. Very insightful. Thank you.